Our God, our Father, our Creator in heaven, we're thankful to be able to be here again today to serve and worship Thee, to remember our Savior's death on the cross for our sins, and to remember that always be mindful that He did arise from the grave, and He now rules over his church. Father, we're thankful for the church that meets here in Missouri. We ask thee to be with us that we'll ever continue to use your word as our guide. We ask thee to be with Brother David this morning, other teachers in the uh, building here teaching separate classes. Be with them and help them to remember the things that they have uh, studied to present to us at this time. And help us, Father, to always have hearts that's open to your truth, ready to receive it. And help us, Father, to always obey it. Again, we thank thee, Father, for the many blessings, both spiritual and physical, as we know that all good things do come from thee. We are mindful, Father, of those of thine that are in a terrible <coughs> snowstorm and floods during this time. We ask thee to be with them as they call upon thee for help. Father, help us to ever walk in the faith, grow in spirit, and grow in love. For then those things that are righteous, we're indeed thankful for the righteousness of the Godhead. And help us to ever remember that that's where we get our learning from. Be with us the rest of this service. On throughout these services today, we pray that everything we do will be in accordance to your will. Forgive us and guide us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Ephesians 5, I believe, is where we start today. Ephesians chapter 5. Um, we had, I, I believe we had discussed the first two verses, so let me go back and, and uh, redo that. Um, of course, it, starting with the word therefore, um, it um, means that we need to understand where we just came from because the writer will be basing what he says upon what he had just said. Therefore, be imitators of God. Okay, now, in the context, what had Paul just got through talking about that he now says therefore the imitators of God in what particular sense or what particular area are we to be imitators of God based upon what he says in verse 32 of chapter 4 being kind and tender hearted <clears throat> and that leads to what in verse 32 Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. That's right. Yeah. So we're to be imitators of God in being kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you, therefore be imitators of God and beloved children. So uh, it's uh, it's one thing. To call God our Father, that sounds real nice, it, it sounds real, and it should, it, it, it should feel very close and tender, but there's a practical side to that. Uh, if we call God our Father, uh, there's an indication, uh, according to these two verses, there's a 
practical side of that, that we're to imitate God. We're, we're to try to be like Him. And so if we, if we look at God and we appreciate the fact that He's kind, that He's tenderhearted, that He forgives, okay, then if He's my Father, then I'm going to make that a part of my character also. So therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So, this thing about imitating God in verse 1, verse 1 sort of is sandwiched between verse 32 of chapter 4 and uh, verse uh, 2 of chapter 5. Uh, we're to be imitators of God's beloved children. That takes us back to verse 32 forgiving, kind, tenderhearted, and so forth. And then verse 2 of chapter 5, walk in love. So there's our other occurrence or another occurrence of this key word walk that we're looking at here in this section of Ephesians beginning in chapter 4. A manner of life that is characterized by love. Uh, just as Christ also loved you, gave himself up for us, offering sacrifice, and so forth. Uh, it's really important, and I know I've done this before, but I, I don't, don't mind repeating it. I know that I'm repeating myself. I don't mind repeating it, that we, we've got to have a proper concept, a proper definition of love. And as always, if we... If we can, this is not always true, I understand that. But if we can, and many times we are able to do this, let the Bible define the word. Let the Bible define the concept. Uh, and when it comes to a definition of love, uh, we, we talked about John 3.16 last Sunday, but we didn't do the love definition part of that verse. John 3.16, in my judgment, is the very best definition of love you will find anywhere. I, um, I don't care what Bible dictionary you use or what um, whatever Greek sources you look, whatever. I, nothing beats a good English definition from the text of the concept. And so John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. Love is making a sacrifice. He gave his only begotten son. It's making a sacrifice of that which has great value and meaning to me. That whosoever believes on him might not perish but have eternal life. Love is making a sacrifice of that which has great meaning to me in order that the object of my love is made a better person. And then going back to the beginning of verse 16, God so loved the world, <coughs> the world that hated him, that despised him, mistreated him. So those are the four elements of love. Uh, making a sacrifice of that which has great meaning to me in order that the object of my love might be made a better person. And I do this for those who don't always love me. You take that definition of love and put it into a marriage, and if both people are loving one another that way, problems will pretty well vanish. If you have two people waking up every morning and they are committed to loving one another in that sense, then you, you've got a, the basis for an outstanding marriage. Okay, uh, so bringing it back to uh, our relationship with brethren, Walk in love. Bring this into a local church. How many, and a lot of you, your memories go back a long way, just like mine do. How many problems have you, have you seen in local churches throughout the years that would have been solved if this kind of love had characterized everybody? I'm not saying there won't be, just like in a marriage, there will be blips along the way, I understand that. But the frequency of the problems and the severity of the problems will be, will be lessened dramatically if we understand John 3.16 love. And verse 2 of Ephesians 5 is really uh, a short...
shorter definition of, of John 3.16. Uh, Christ also loved you, gave himself up for us. There's the sacrifice that's, that's uh, meaningfully gave up his life. An offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. It was something that was pleasing uh, to God. So with, with that kind of love in place, it ought to ideally uh, make stronger bonds between brethren, lessen, as I said, the, the problems that we would experience from time to time. And again, this works in marriage, works in a friendship, works in a local church, works on the job. Uh, John 316 love pretty well does away with, with so many problems that would be in various relationships. All right, any, any questions or comments there on those first <clears throat> first two verses of chapter five? All right. Now, verse three, and we're going to be seeing a lot of this in beginning in verse three and going through verse twenty. Um, if you go through here and take a look at the word but, B-U-T. However, but, 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 but. And following the word but, <coughs> you've got Paul saying, here's, here's what you really need to do. Instead of one thing, here's what you really need to do. So if you're marking your text, and you, you go through here and you see these not buts and, and so forth. Remember, you always emphasize. You, you emphasize the phrase after the word but. That's not saying you can't learn something from the phrase that follows the word do not. But the emphasis is upon the phrase after the word but. So but, immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Now, how many sins are mentioned in verse 3, the first part of verse 3? How many sins? Only generically. Yeah, okay, what are they? Impurity, greed, immorality. All oh, right, that's right. Immorality, impurity, and greed. I find that interesting. That we're, we're real immorality, and we get down on people and live immoral lives. We just, how can people be that way? That's right. Impurity in people's lives, moral impurity, sexual impurity, huh? We just. But then there's that person. And how many times do we put greed? In with sexual immorality and sexual impurity. How many times we do that? Not a lot. The point being, it's fine enough to be immoral and impure, but like the Pharisees who emphasize some things to the exclusion of others, uh, we can emphasize and come down strong on immorality and impurity and then in our personal lives we may be moral and pure but then we're, we're greedy tight-fisted we just hold on to every penny we've got we're not going to share it with anybody we do anything and when we do that and we put ourselves in the same category as what? <coughs> the immoral and the impure and it's a difference. If, if, I, can, if I understand uh, the, the, the reading here. And so he said, it must not even be named among you. And again, I don't, we don't have the background. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, when Paul talks about some of these things, it, it's been curious to me whether or not he knew that some of these problems existed in Ephesus. Um, and so he's dealing with them. This is his way of dealing with them. Uh, I, I don't, we don't know that, but I, I'm just, I wondered about that. If, if he just sort of randomly picked these out and said, well, I'll just, you know, talk about this. Or was he doing it because there was a, 
a specific need and a problem here. I don't know. But anyway, uh, uh, if people are saints, these things are not to be named among us, not to be characterized. What uh, is the meaning? Of, uh, well, how do I ask this question? What is the meaning of the word saint or what is a saint? Answer either one of those questions you want. What, uh, what is a saint? What is the meaning of the word saint? Members of the church are the saints. The, the people. Okay, but I'm looking for a definition of saint. I mean, what is a definition of, of, of a saint? Set apart. Who said set apart? Okay. Yeah. Oh, what were you going to say? One that set himself aside for God. Okay, yeah, both of these, that's exactly right. What other English words... Uh, come from this word that's translated saint here. Sanctified. Sanctified is one of them. Another one is what? Holy, <laughs> sanctified, and saints are three English words and they all come from the same Greek word. And so a saint, and I, I hope I don't have to explain this to people here, but a saint is not someone who has been dead for a long time and because of super, super, super holiness, they get voted into sainthood. Uh, I, I've always thought, and I don't know if anybody's ever tried this or not, but I've always thought it would be curious to, for people to, after a lesson like this on Sunday morning, go to work on Monday morning. And, at the first call to like, tell people that you found out yesterday that you're a saint. And just see what the reaction is on the part of people. Because I think most religious people have a, a concept that the oh, saint is super holy. Well, letters were written to saints in the first century. And here, he talks about saints. So saints are not people who have been dead and they're super holy and they voted into sainthood. They're people who have set themselves apart. They have made a deliberate choice to be holy. That they've set themselves apart from the world. So, uh, immorality, impurity, or greed must not even be named among you as it is proper among those who have set themselves apart from such lifestyles. Now, these, these things, we just we don't have anything to do with it. Now, we need to be careful with this concept uh, that we don't leave a, a wrong impression with people that we work with or family or whatever and we turn ourselves into sort of a goody two shoes I'm just so holy I don't know no you, you you let you let it be known that you are holy not by talking that way but by living a certain way you just you just don't do things or you do do things that convey the message to other people I've set myself apart from whatever it is. So there is a <clears throat> certain kind of conduct that uh, allows a person to view themselves and for God to view them as being holy people, uh, sanctified people, people who are saints. Now, verse 4 is one of the more interesting verses um, in this context to me. Verse 4, again, mentions how many sins? Verse 4. The first part, I'm sorry, the first part of verse 4. Before the word, between the words no and the word but. Well, how many sins are mentioned here? First one is what? Filthy mess. Silly talk. I'm reading from the American Standard Version. Silly talk or coarse jesting. Now, here's where uh, word studies are really uh, important. These three sins are sins of the what? Oh. Exactly. This addresses the way what kind of people talk. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 people of the world. 
this is the kind of, of language that what kind of people do not <laughs> saints saints don't talk this way and there are three general categories and of course the uh, unfortunate thing here is I cannot go through here and say okay uh, filthy talk here's an example no 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 no, no. can't do that um, coarse jesting I, I can't give you an example I mean I don't know what they are but I can't give and then uh, the silly talk so let's just start with filthiness does is there anybody here who struggles with an ex to, to come up with an, an ex in your mind, not out of your mouth? Anybody here who has a problem in their mind saying, yeah, I, I can think of examples of, of filthy talk. Anybody have a problem coming up with examples? No, we, we don't filthy talk. We know exactly what it is. It, it, you know, whenever, you, you know, teenagers, before that, which I find, I've got a nine-year-old granddaughter, and she she has a vocabulary. Not she doesn't use it. I'm not saying that, but she she knows what certain words are and what they mean. I did not know those words until I was in junior high. Amen. And nowadays, in elementary school. They know, and she will tell me, she said, it's not good to use that. And she doesn't say the word, she just, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And I thought, wow, good tonight. And then to know what it means, I just, yeah, well, okay. David, oh, uh, yeah. I just going to point out, when we were growing up, we didn't see a lot of that on television. You know, when I was a youngster, I mean, they still turn the TV off at midnight. But yeah. What I'm saying is, uh, there is nothing excluded. No, and, and even and, and 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 my granddaughter, they they pretty well monitor what she watches on TV. But that doesn't mean she doesn't go to school and is around kids who are not monitored and and you know and they, they pick this language up. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad she recognizes it as filthy. She, she, she knows that. <clears throat> All right, silly talk. So, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Owen. Before you leave that, when I was growing up, it was the pathway to manhood to use that kind of language. Yeah, right, yeah. You just tried <clears throat> to do it. Right. Yeah, kind of a rite of passage. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Yeah, when I was in the Coast Guard, I, I was around guys that uh, they, they talked a certain way and they acted in such a way because it was expected of sailors. If you were a sailor, whether Navy or Coast Guard, that you were supposed to do this or say that or, or whatever, yeah. And I, ironically, it's, it, it's not, a, uh, it, it's not a, a matter of a man, it's not a matter of man. It's very opposite. Yeah, right. Therefore, cuss like a sailor. Yeah, right. Term that we use exactly, to yeah. And, and some guys did it. And I think it was right, but they did it because it was expected of them. Right. It's still wrong, but they did it. Jason. George Patton, General George Patton, insisted that you could not lead men effectively without swearing. General yeah. Patton is another subject for another time in another place. <laughs> but, but yeah. But my, my point was yeah. that, that, that much like other types of yeah. simple behavior, it's, it's very culturally yeah. pervasive. Yeah. yeah. George Patton and Harry Truman. Those those are two <laughs> those are two unique historical figures. Yeah. All right. So filthiness. You can't talk filthy. Um Silly talk. So after services, you got you guys stand out there in the foyer. You can't tell any jokes. You, you, you can't be silly, you know. Is that what you're talking about here? I think it goes back to the first half of the sentence, as is proper amongst saints. 
And I, and I view the coarse jesting and silly talk as if it diminishes your reputation <clears throat> or your credibility amongst people of the world, you ought to stay as far away from it as you can. Right, exactly. And I think that's right. The, the definition of this word, silly talk, is the speech of a fool. Can you speak like a fool and not be filthy? It's kind of hard. It, 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 um, to, to separate those two, silly talk would involve uh, filthiness. But if, it, if, it's, it's, if it's just idiotic, just stupid, stupid talk is it, really what this this idea of, of silly talk is. It, it's just stupid stuff, wasn't it? To piggyback on what Rick said about talk that makes yourself look worse or mm -hmm. less credible, what about talk that makes someone else look worse and less credible? Wouldn't I think that's the course jesting. I, well, we'll get to course jesting in a minute. I, let us hit on something that um, I had not thought about that, really. Anybody remember a comedian who was known for that very thing? Rodney Dangerfield. Dangerfield was one of them. Don Rickles. They made a good living off of speaking to other people. It just put it, and they were doing it in a jesting way. I don't think I'm serious about it. Uh, but they, they, they did that. And so, yeah, I think Linda's hit on something like that I hadn't thought about. Yeah, uh, whatever we use language that the, the basis of another person, uh, yeah, I, I think that would, would qualify. I didn't hear what Linda said. Uh, a speech that puts other people down. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say that, you know, these night shows that come on after the news, which I don't watch, they make all these foolish talks about the president or whatever, you know, to me that's foolish talking. Yeah. You know, it's, like I say, putting him down or making some kind of comments to make him look ridiculous or whatever. Yeah, there's no question that TV has been on a downward slope for a long time. Rick, did you have? I just was uh, thinking about Ecclesiastes chapter 5, about the first six verses where he yeah. said, let your words be few. The idea to me is, you made a comment a week ago about the old saying, <clears throat> when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. Mm -hmm. Well, how does a person work toward getting that way? <clears throat> if the majority of the words coming out of your mouth are worth listening to, then you're headed that direction. Yeah. If most people view what you have, to, a good part of what you have to say <coughs> is, it doesn't really have any value to anybody or anything, that to me would also fall in the category of silly talk. Right. Just dilutes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, our speech needs to be with, well, uh, Colossians, uh, what's the verse I'm looking for? Colossians. Colossians 2, 3. Let your speech yeah. be with Colossians 4. Com Colossians 4. four. With grace, season with salt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the verse I'm looking for. Yeah. That's the way that, that, that when we open our mouths, people don't go, oh, no, what's he about to say? But rather, as I illustrated with the guy in Charles Garner last week, people want to listen. What verse? Six. Six. Four, okay, six. four to six, yeah. Let our speech be with grace. And again, now the word grace does not mean unmerited favor there. It does in most other places. But the word grace, the basic idea of grace is that which is pleasant. That which is pleasing. And that can be the way we act or the way we talk. And there, Colossians 4 6, the way we talk. So let our speech be with, with, with grace, with that which is pleasing, seasoned with salt, that which has a good effect upon people. Um, and as I think I said last week, there's no book, probably in the Bible, that deals with this subject of uh, our speech as thoroughly as uh, uh, Proverbs does. If you want to do a great, great study on the power of the tongue, good and bad, 
go to the book of Proverbs, do a word search for tongue, uh, just start there, and then look at related verses, which, which uh, tell you about the power of, of the tongue. Okay, filthiness, that's just crude, vulgar stuff. Uh, silly talk, the idiotic, stupid stuff. Then we come to the word, and, and here's where we can get tripped up. The American Standard Version here has coarse jesting. What do other translations uh, have if you, if you didn't have that? Mine says levity. Levity? Okay. Well, see, that, that leaves the impression that we've got to walk around. In, in fact, when I was in high school, we had a preacher, an old preacher, uh, he held several meetings for us, and uh, in one night after services, people were standing around out in the foyer, and and they were laughing, having a good time, and I've never forgotten. He he was standing there, and he turned to me and he said, oh, "There's too much levity." Every time I hear the word levity, I, I think of that that old preacher, and he was the type of guy that always walked around with a frown. And he really thought that people having a good time and laughing violated scripture. Um, here again, a, a, um, a word study of where this word comes from is, is interesting for me. Um, okay. Do you know what a double entendre is? A double entendre? Oh, everybody knows. Let me give you an example. You're driving in your car, and you come to a stoplight, and there's a car out ahead of you, and the bumper sticker says, Nurses have patience. Yuck, 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 yuck. Teachers have class. Oh, my goodness. Those are double entendres. And those are the Hermitsons. Have you ever pulled up behind a pickup truck? <coughs> and had another kind of it? I, 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 I will give you an example. I'm serious, don't give me an example. Ever seen another bumper sticker with a double entendre that you would not want to be? Sure, we, we've all, and we know what they are. That's condemned here. Absolutely condemned. That kind of double entendre, not the teachers have class and nurses have patience. That's, I mean, we may moan at the, you know, the joke, but uh, that's, that's not what's condemned, is it? And having a good time getting together and you're laughing, that, that, that's good medicine. The Bible teaches that. But when we cross the line, and it may be a thin one, and we start deciding we're going to be clever. We're going to be real cute. And so we get into these double entendres that when we use them, a lot of people, hopefully, will just go, you know, you're going to embarrass people. You know, and, and, and whenever you say, you shouldn't talk that way, you say, I know what I meant. I meant, no, 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 no. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Or you wouldn't have done it. You, you did it in order to make people uncomfortable. Okay? Just be honest about it. That's what you wanted to do. And you had the fallback of when they accused you of doing the nasty part. You said, no, that's not what I meant to do. No, you didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> you did. And if you wanted to do the first part of the thing, just do the first part. Don't do the nasty part. Don't do that. Just forget it. Um... So just from these three things in the first part of verse 4, <laughs> is it important the way a saint talks, how a saint communicates, the, the things that, that come out of, of the mouth of, of a saint? I, I, I think to uh, ask that question is to answer it. Absolutely. Now, the latter part of verse 4, 
But, now here's the part. If, if you could get people to take care of the latter part of verse 4, you'd do away with the first part. Giving of thanks. If we used our mouths, and this, I don't think, has to be limited to prayer, uh, would certainly include it. But if we spend our time using our mouths to give thanks to God, uh, in prayer, or in just communicating with other people. Um, just as a, how, how often have you found yourself in, in conversation with other saints? And in the process of maybe an extended conversation, you hear that person say, yeah, I am so thankful for it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I am just, this, this is great. I, I'm so thankful. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the list of things that we can say there after I'm so thankful for is just enormous. Would you rather be around a person like that who says, I, I am so thankful. There's, there's no need for double entendre. There's no need for the talk of an idiot. There's no need for being immoral. It, the, People who are busy using their tongues <coughs> giving thanks, whether it's in private or public prayer or in just conversation with other people, they're not going to be characterized by that other stuff. But watch this, Jim. You know, I'm reminded of what David said in the long ago. And if we could fix our mind on this, then I think we'd be a lot better off. David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted. You know, uh, I used to uh, be in class with a guy, and he said, a lot of times people, uh, they, they don't, their brain, they start talking before their brain is yeah. engaged. And that's what we do a lot of times. Yeah. So, and whatever we say, it ought to be sound. Whatever we say, yeah. it ought to be sound. I'm reminded in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 10, chapter, 12 and verses uh, 36 and 37. <clears throat> but, I, uh, but I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Yeah. So we need to focus on yeah. our mouth of what we say and what we That's try. Right. Yeah, what you said from David and from, from Jesus there, the, the words of our mouth depend upon, and they reflect upon what? The meditation of our heart. You know, um, I, I, well, I, I wonder when we we say something and we say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Well, why were you thinking? It, 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 if we didn't want to say it, then what? I, I just wasn't thinking. Really? They weren't thought, where that, where that came from? I, I, that's, um, so, yeah, what Brother Washington said, uh, the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart they go together hand in glove. You know, we're not going to say anything that we weren't thinking. And so we need to make sure that what our thinking is is something that's acceptable uh, to God. All right. Um, so no filthiness, no silly talk, no coarse jesting, which are not fitting for saints, rather giving thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral nor impure person or covetous man. Now, how does this parallel with verse 3? Immorality, impurity, greed. Now, down in verse 5, no immoral man, no impure person or covetous man. Are those parallel? For them? So, uh, one of the major lessons we can learn here, as we said a moment ago, 
It's, it's fine to, to not be immoral, to not be impure. That, that's fine. But let's make sure that we're also not greedy, covetous people. Evidently, God puts those people into the same category. And a covetous man is what kind of a man? <clears throat> puts things in this world above the things of God. Okay. And there's a word for that. It's in the verse. A covetous man who is? An idolater. An idolater. Yeah. He, he's put up as his idol. Something besides God. It may not be, well, let me rephrase that. Is it always that our idols are wrong in and of themselves? Anytime we have an idol that it is inherently a wrong thing? That's not a trick question. I'm not trying to trick anybody. No, as long as we don't worship it. Huh? As long as we don't worship it. That's right. Idol, idols can be recreation. There are some recreational things that I love to do. And they can very quickly become my idol. The, the, the thing that if, 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 if I live in certain areas of the country, I'm afraid I'd do nothing but hike. Because I love it. And I love being in the outdoors. Uh, I, absolutely. And that can become an idol. There's nothing wrong with that kind of stuff. But when it, it takes the place of God, and that's what I covet, that's what I want to do, and I want to use my time, then I've got, I've got a serious problem with God. So, and, and covetousness, which is idolatry, is right back there in the category with immoral, immorality and impurity. So we need to, we need to understand that, while it's, like I said, it, it's good to not be immoral, to not be impure, that, that's great. Uh, but let's make sure that the devil doesn't suck us in to something just as bad. And that's greed and covetousness. All right, why don't we stop here, and uh, we'll pick up here in verse, uh, verse 5 uh, next week. Okay, thank you.